Hey guys, Level Cap here. Today we've got some excellent gaming topics to discuss provided by you guys, the community. As long as it's gaming related, interesting and relevant, there's a good chance I'll be discussing one of your topics in one of my mailbox videos. So please feel free to leave your topics in the description below. The first topic comes from Roach who says, with the new ruling by the World Health Organization that playing video games can be considered a disorder, what are your thoughts on gaming too much? Will you restrict your own kids' gaming habits? And finally, do you agree or disagree with the World Health Organization and its ruling? Now, obviously this news isn't something to be taken lightly for multiple reasons. One, people are going to freak out. Parents, people who see their kids playing lots of video games, they're gonna be like, oh my God, what's gaming disorder? Is my kid gonna get it? Should How much should they be playing video games? What's healthy, you know, they're gonna be probably a bit concerned about it. And there's nothing wrong with being aware and researching and trying to figure out what's wrong with your kid, but the sound of gaming disorder in general and the broad diagnosis that's been portrayed by the World Health Organization uh, can be argued that it's not particularly helpful. And a lot of medical experts are not happy with the definition of gaming disorder because it treats gaming disorder as sort of a substance abuse, right? Where the problem in your life is the gaming and not necessarily something else. Obviously gaming in many ways is used as a, in a way a therapy or a way of dealing with many other issues in life. For example, if you had family stress, domestic abuse, sexual abuse, things that are actual serious problems in life, uh, and you use gaming as an escape from that and therefore you game too much or to an excessive amount and that is seen as the problem and it's diagnosed as gaming disorder, all of a sudden you've misdiagnosed a problem, right? As a doctor, you're saying, okay, well, let's take away these games because clearly uh, this person has gaming disorder, which is completely missing the other problems that are causing excessive gaming in life. And so that's the problem right now is it's only being diagnosed as substance abuse where the gaming itself is the problem and other things are not the problem. So medical experts are not happy with the diagnosis because of just how poorly researched it is right now. It feels like it's rushed. It feels like the World Health Organization wants to make people aware that gaming can be an issue and obviously it can be used in a, as substance abuse where the gaming itself is actually the problem, but that's only one facet of gaming related issues. And so they're just worried that it's going to lead to a lot of misdiagnosis and a lot of unnecessary panic or misdiagnosis by parents and stuff too, because obviously it's big news. Lots of people heard about it. Everybody tries to diagnose their own family, their own kids, that sort of thing. And so ultimately the rush process of the World Health Organization could be a bit of a problem. I have no problem with uh, people classifying disorders and diseases, especially with gaming stuff. I'm not trying to defend gaming as this beacon of escape for humanity and as this great thing with no downsides. There's obviously downsides to gaming. Um, it's not good for everyone. People with addictive tendencies can make anything their addiction and gaming has certainly become an addiction for many people. Um, and that's something that needs to be looked at and treated, but done so properly. As far as things go with my kid, obviously I'm not going to restrict him from playing video games. That would be quite hypocritical of me to do. Um, but I will try and be cognizant and aware of what's going on in his life and try and moderate things. Anything in life in excess can be bad. So if I see problems or something happen, I'll try and intervene. But I'm so far off from that point right now since he's not even a year old yet that it's not been something that's on my mind. The next topic comes from Eric Wade, who says, what are your thoughts on some shooters abandoning traditional unlock based progression like we see with Call of Duty and Battlefield 4 in favor of systems like we see with Insurgency, Sandstorm or Overwatch, where everyone has everything unlocked from the beginning? I definitely think this is an interesting topic and there's merits to both styles of systems. Basically, if you have cool weapons or gear that's tied into progression systems, you can use those weapons and gear to sort of either get an advantage over your opponents or use it as one more way of showing off how much work you've put into a game or how more advanced you are in a game. Players like to show off their stuff online. It's what makes digital items and assets valuable and why people spend money on games like Overwatch to look cool or stand out from the crowd. 
Both systems are cool, I like both systems, and there's pros and cons to both. If you take, say, the Battlefield or Call of Duty system, which could be extrapolated even into maybe a Destiny system where hundreds upon hundreds of hours and lots of teamwork uh, nets you really high level items combined with some random chance elements of uh, defeating bosses and picking up gear that you find in the world. These things can be really cool representations of your progress, but they can also be really daunting for new players just getting into the game. Say you get into a game late and players are already hundreds and hundreds of hours ahead of you in progression. It can feel a bit daunting or like you'll never be able to catch up with people or be as effective at people as people who have all the high level gear. That can be a downside to the system for sure. Luckily, Battlefield and COD don't really do too much of that. For the most part, the starting weapons you get in both games can compete with high level weapons. And if there is a gun that's really powerful, Usually both games don't make it too hard to unlock that weapon if it's something you really want. Ultimately, they just get to become fun tasks that you get to do in-game to try and unlock weapons, and the time requirement isn't too intense. Since you already paid the $50 or $60, whatever it is for the game, they don't want you to have to work too hard to experience all the features. Contrast that with games like Insurgency that give you all the weapons right at the start. There isn't much of a progression system built in aside from cosmetic progression. And that can be fine too. It really depends on the game. But something to know about Call of Duty and Battlefield is that creating a really elaborate weapon progression system where Battlefield games have like 60, 70, even over 100 guns sometimes. That takes a lot of money and resources to uh, offer that in a progression-based system. Take Insurgency, where the devs clearly don't have as much money to work with and much fewer weapons. You can't really create much of an interesting progression system there unless you add an extra 40 guns to the game. That takes a lot of dev time. It takes a lot of money. So bigger developers can integrate the weapon unlocks to their progression system. I think progression systems in general are very powerful tools and anytime a developer can take advantage of them to increase players uh, interest in completing tasks and stuff like that is going to be a big benefit to them and how long people are interested in playing their game. The more money you have the more elaborate you can create a progression system whether it's a system that focuses on cosmetic unlocks only where you get all the guns at the start of the game or it's a system that has cosmetic and weapon unlocks is really up to the devs and the style of the game. I don't think we're ever going to see a game switch over to one system or the other, and I don't really prefer one system over the other as long as the progression and the timing of it all seems to sort of line up well, the assignments are fun, and it doesn't feel grindy. I think too many times developers can make these systems feel very grindy, and that's where they get kind of a bad rap. The next topic comes from Miles, who actually references an old video I made back in 2012, an old mailbox video, where I talk about some first-person shooter game ideas that I didn't really want to elaborate on because I wanted to try and get some of these games made, and talking about them online would essentially give away the ideas or the concepts where other people could make these games. He wants to know if, one, the ideas are still relevant, have other game developers beat me to the punch, and if I'm going to do anything about them. And I kind of want to evolve this question into just an interesting topic a little bit, where if you're trying to get into the game industry, it does make a lot of sense to think about game design and game development. What games would you want to play? Is there a cool game that you like playing, but you could see it improve massively? Is there a new genre that you think you could develop? I definitely have some older ideas that I've updated and evolved a little bit over the years. Technology and trends have changed and updated a little bit. Things have to always be relevant, but for the most part, my core game ideas for things that I've been wanting to make uh, for a long time haven't really changed and no developers have really done what I want to do yet. So I have some ideas just on the back burner for if the opportunity ever arises. And that's a good stance to take if you are in or around the game industry. Have some cool game ideas on the back burner. Have some 
concepts that you can pitch to somebody if the opportunity arises because you never know where you may end up. Since making that video in 2012, I have had the opportunity to pitch those game concepts to developers. Obviously, we didn't make my game, but it was helpful to have the opportunity to pitch the ideas to different design studios and see what they thought of it and get feedback from them on terms of both how to make the pitch more attractive and the realist the realism of making these concepts. And it's cool to think about. Realistically, I would probably have to make some of my game, in, uh, game ideas uh, as a mod team, you know, a team of people working freelance and just as a passion project because uh, getting into the game industry and designing a game with no actual game designer experience under your belt is something that's just not gonna happen in a big studio. Nobody's gonna put money behind you. So you kinda have to prove your concept, but the cool thing is that we live in a world where people like Notch and people like Brendan Green can make huge games from just mod concepts or fun little indie projects with small teams of just a few people starting off with. And so we're definitely in a world where these things can happen. And it's one of those things, one of the few things I think that would actually take me away from YouTubing is if I had the opportunity to design uh, one of my game ideas. Anyway, that's kind of where I am with it now, but I do encourage anybody out there to come up with cool game ideas. And if you're trying to get into the industry, pitch them or think of cool concepts or why your concepts would be cool. A lot of it has to do with philosophy and understanding people and why people like games for what reasons. You know, it has to be a bit more in depth and a bit more insightful to the market or mechanics that are fun and why they're fun. Those kind of things are cool to think about. I like thinking about them and it can certainly help when trying to pitch a game concept to a team of developers. But anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts on these topics in the comments down below. Don't forget to leave any topics or questions you have for me for the next Mailbox episode. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. This is Level Cap, signing off.